This is the Power to a Podcast, show 65. I'm following A, B, C, and D. My kids are still getting They're still not getting it. So what do we go back and tell the, the company? Well, I followed it with fidelity. My kids still don't learn it. Now I have the autonomy as a teacher to step out and say, my kids aren't getting it. I've got to try another way. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be with you in a minute. And Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. going on everyone this is ken ehrman host of the power to podcast and i am here with my co-host mr matt a full box of crayons rogers matt how how are we doing tonight you know ken we are doing super well you know it is 11 o'clock um 11 06 to be precise on a thursday evening our interview ended, you know, we start these uh, these interviews at nine o'clock and our interview ended about, I don't know, 10, 15. And we had such a good conversation that we spent 40 plus minutes talking about it and, and just like status of education. It just brought up all the greatest things. Um, so my, oh my, like I'm just, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah. So, you know, in case everybody doesn't know this, we almost always record on Tuesdays. We shift to things because I was away at a conference presenting. Um, so that's why we're on a Thursday, but we're Tuesdays at 9 p.m. And honestly, we went with 9 p.m. because that's after my kids go to sleep. So I can still help with bedtime. Matt can walk his dogs 28 miles so they can still bark during <laughs> our recordings. Um, but it works out sometimes as well with our, our West Coast or our Central Time Zone guests. It's not as late for them. But I am typically in bed for a while at this point, except on podcast nights, because we get guests like we had tonight with uh, Joanne Nocera, who just get us jacked up, jazzed up. And even if we went to if we did our intro five minutes after we finished with her and signed off of here, there's no way I'd be going to sleep because. Uh, this this was an awesome interview. Um, I will usually meet with our guests on Sunday just to make sure technology is not an issue. Talk to them for a couple minutes. And I texted Matt right away and said, we're going to have an awesome guest tonight. And she did not disappoint. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that we heard was a, you know, personal account and real world connections. You know, I, I think... We've been really fortunate, Ken, in a lot of our conversations to talk to educators that actually get education and actually get the state of education right now and um, really give permission to, you know, as educators do what we feel is the best for kids. And Joanne just kind of nailed that on the head. Um, there are some stories and, and kind of the expansion of ideas that I know for us, what we spend all our time saying is like, yeah, her ideology matches our ideology. It is, you know, exactly what um, we believe in and, and just some some really great nuggets of information that just align so well with what, what education should be. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. You know, we've had, I've been saying it a lot lately on here and just when I've been talking to people about, you know, hosting a podcast or I am blown away at the amount of guests that we've been able to talk to now for a little bit over a year. I mean, this is show 65. I would estimate we've had about probably 55 guests. I think we've done about 10 shows on our own somewhere around there where we didn't have one. And they have just all been so awesome from so many different States. We've hit every time zone. I would estimate we're 
probably nearing in on 35 different states that we've interviewed people from. So just a lot of different geographic perspectives, economic perspectives in the in the schools that they, they teach in, that they lead in. We've had keynote speakers, we've had authors. And Joanne, you know, like you said, very practical. She clearly was a great educator. She clearly still gets it as a administrator now, but she had some of the best stories we've had. Like just, she was just bursting with excitement talking about these stories from her classroom from, you know, potentially up to 20 years ago. And so it was just, it was just really cool. I just, I really loved her stories. I really loved her connections to letting the kids be creative, letting them draw, letting them think outside the box. She really gave us simple, practical ways to do it. And that was I think what I appreciated the most was the simplicity in her creativity versus the, um, you know, trying to make things just so incredibly complicated to try to pull out that creativity. I so, just think the ahead. one thing that I want to add is, you know, and we'll hear early on in this episode is she's another guest who didn't start an education. And I think I always leave those episodes reminding myself how lucky we are as educators naturally. And so if you were uh, in another career beforehand, like there's a different drive or hunger or appreciation for being in the classroom that we as, you know, full career educators need to listen to and recognize, you know, yeah, we, we don't get uh, bonuses and we don't get, you know, some of the perks, but we have a much fuller life many times because of being educators that a lot of people envy. So um, I think you'll kind of hear that and just, again, the this drive for, for doing the best by kids and, um, and really creating a lasting impression, which was the, the most impressive thing that I heard from the episode. Yeah, for sure. So let's go ahead and jump into that interview with Joanne Nocera. Hi, Joanne. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? Good. Thanks, Ken. I'm glad to be here. And Matt, too. I'm glad to be here on your show. Absolutely. So just start things off for us. Keep it super simple. Just tell us officially who you are, where you are coming from. And I know you have a, a uh, long, successful career, but just kind of give us a snapshot of, of where you have navigated through education and where that's landed you now. All right. I'm Joanne Nocera. I have been in education for 23 years. Before that, I was on a foreign exchange trading floor at Goldman Sachs, completely changed directions into education, went back for my master's degree and never looked back. I absolutely loved every minute of it. I'm a creative at heart, so I was happy to bring creativity into the classroom. And that kind of was the way I ignited the spark in my students. They really came alive. So it, it, it's a great journey. I wrote a book about it. I'll give you back my crayons, 10 keys to unlocking the creative child within. And so there's at the end of each chapter, there's ways for, for parents and children to unlock their creativity and really enjoy life again. That's awesome. And what are you doing now? Now I'm an, admin, I'm an administrator. I, um, I write grants and I get, um, I'm happy to have artists come into the school and work with us. And so I built a parent academy with a lot of teachers in my school district that were passionate about, uh, you know, working together with parents, bringing students in at night with their parents, feeding them and giving them the tools they need to really be successful at home and in school. That's awesome. So I, I really want to dive into the, the creative piece because I know it's something that uh, Matt and I are both really passionate about. But anytime I get to talk to an educator on here or, or just in general that goes back to education after being in, we'll just say the professional world, I always find that fascinating one because of just making that big transition. But you know, as, as educators, a common phrase that we hear in elementary school is, I'm preparing you for middle school. Middle school, I'm preparing you for high school. High school, I'm preparing you for the real world. But as lifelong students that become teachers instantly, I also like the joke that we don't really know what the real world is because we've never been in the real world, um, you know, in terms of the professional sense. So what are things that you know that you gained from being in the, the stock exchange, being in that professional setting 
that you feel has had a huge impact on the way you communicate with students or the way you communicate with parents or just the way you carry yourself in education that a lot of educators may not have that perspective because they don't have that experience? Well, definitely being corporate America, you definitely learn how to get along with a lot of different personalities. And so right there off the bat, it's, it's adult driven, right? Um, but in the schools, it really should be student driven. And a lot of times in the schools, it becomes adult driven and uh, it gets tangled up where it shouldn't be. Uh, so you, that, ha- you know, I, I just transferred over what I learned and really accepting students for who they are the way I did when I was in corporate America, because to get along, you have to have a good work ethic. You have to be super organized. And uh, teachers who are successful have those abilities and have that skill set. And so I've seen that a lot in my administrative work. I could tell right away if that classroom is going to be amazing and just lighting up and being a leader to the other classrooms. And so you, you could just see it right off the bat. And as coming into education as a, you know, an opportunity to, you know, have a, a business-based uh, or, or corporate America style role sometimes leads to, at least in my opinion, you know, really focused teachers that are completely there for the right purpose. You know, I've been in the classroom only, Ken has only ever really been in the classroom and it is just what is normal. And at least from my experience, and you can maybe speak to this, you know, the gift of being able to shape kids' lives is so much more for someone like you who has experience of what, you know, a, a less glamorous uh, job might be, a more, you know, rigid job it, to, to be paid to make difference on kids' lives and make a difference. And, you know, the, the emotional gratitude or, or um, wholeness that you get from teaching really drives you to be so much more and and take the most of that opportunity. Can you kind of speak to that? That is so true, Matt. I can't say it enough. Um, I It wasn't about the money. It, it really, at first it was, I, I did, I always wanted to be a teacher and I changed directions because I thought that making more money would make me happy. And of course not. It's, it's really, you have to fill your soul with what you were meant to do. What is your purpose? What is your why? And not, you know, teaching is not for everyone. Um, but what, what I gained by being on that foreign exchange trading floor was the ability to be flexible, right? You, at any moment, you have to be able to change and turn. And that is true to a teacher's life. There might be things that come up that, or you're, you're you know, you're working through instruction. All of a sudden, you, it's like deer in headlights. They don't get it. You've got to switch gears and you've got to say, hey, I've got to try something else. They're just not getting it. And so teachers really do, if they really care, it's not just spray and pray. I'm going to stand up there. I'm going to spit out what I need to say and pray that they get it. You know, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's a, a conversation, communication. You, you'll know if a, a child comes in and they're not having a great day. You have to shift, right? You might have to take that time out to maybe have a morning meeting to give them the, you know, the support that they need so they can get on with their day because they might not be thinking about anything else other than what they've come to the table with that day and it might not be the happiest. Well, right? to, to kind of add to that, you know, I think your perspective is obviously caring for kids, the development of kids, really the, the pureness of what education should be. How do you feel like, and I know we'll get into incorporating, you know, creativity and arts and, and other aspects into the classroom as part of this, but you know, how do you balance the requirements? You know, it was very cut and dry in some capacities in your former career, whereas, you know, there is opportunity for kind of your own stamp uh, in your classroom. How, how do you feel like the idea of having that flexibility, you know, concepts like standardized testing or you know, um, other requirements in that situation where what you want to do is you just want to care for the whole kid and that development, um, some of those uh, red tapes get in the way. 
Yeah, no, I listen, I don't <laughs> mind standardized testing. I just don't think it should be the center point at which everything drives towards that. And that's where we get lost and we 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 forget about that there's an art of teaching. So, you know, when you think about data and everybody's like, ooh, data's a bad word, it really just informs where you need to take the class next. Um you know, I don't want to look at just generalized data information and say, oh, well, as a whole, like, for example, the principal and I discussed in his school that, you know, kids were struggling in the mathematical area, the domain of geometry, for example. OK, so what are you going to drill and kill geometry with worksheets? And they weren't getting it. They were not getting it. So we create a lunch and learn program where basically you use the data. You get to the bottom of it and you say, okay, is it vocabulary? What is it? Well, what does a ray or a perpendicular line mean to you? What if we moved our bodies to form a right angle? What if we created um, using Play-Doh? And some kids need that, right? They need that kinesthetic, that hands-on sensory-based learning, right? They're, they're, they can't learn any other way. It becomes like an entry point. So you might have to do that. Well, these kids showed up. They gave up their recess. They didn't mind. The parents were like, "What? what's going on? My kid loves learning again. What are you doing? Well, we're just meeting them where they're at, meaning I've got to survey you, and that's where the spark comes. I've got to survey you and make sure that I know how your brain unlocks information because if I don't, then I can speak till the cows come home. You're not gonna, It's not going to stick. So how do we make the learning stick? And make the love of learning come out, really, that spark. So that's the first thing. But I, I don't, you know, I don't, I know there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of, um, you know, standardized testing and getting ready for testing and all of that. But really, they could still do that, whether they're on a computer or they're bubbling in on paper. If, if they've got the concept in their mind and it's stuck with them, it, it doesn't matter what platform they use to assess. They're going to get it. They're going to understand it. They're going to remember it. And that's what you want. There's no like magical, oh, if we do so many worksheets per day or if we're online uh, doing so many hours digitally it, that it's gonna, gonna, going to increase their ability. Their ability to learn is based on how they take in the information and they and they remember it. I could not agree with that. That's where the test and spark and survey comes from, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I could not agree with that more. And, you know, like you said, using the data to to hone in on, you know, what skill or what deficit is there across the board or, you know, looking at one skill, one standard and saying, okay, these five students, they need my support. Or, you know, it's I, I feel like we so often take that mindset of which student needs my support. Sometimes you'll find that the data shows that a large majority of the class needs your support, but there's five kids that don't. So what can we enrich them to do? What can we empower them to do so we don't bore them with the instruction that they don't need because they've already shown mastery? We can excite them. We can keep them excited about learning while we give this the other kids the skills that they need to be confident so that they don't lose their excitement in learning. Because a lot of times that's the other pieces. And I, I'm I'm all about creative teaching. I love the kinesthetic. Uh, It was a huge part of my classroom as well. Um, But, you know, sometimes when kids just aren't confident because they're constantly confused, that's why they don't like learning it. It has nothing to do with the delivery. It's that they're they're confused. They're struggling. They're frustrated. And, you know, like you said, so many worksheets, that that stuff's not going to work. But you can still use those online programs that do kind of give you that benchmark assessment of kids. After you've, like you said, unlocked the keys to, to allow the the information to go in through the Plato, through the kinesthetic pieces, all of those, all of those are so important so that they can then showcase their under understanding to it. So, um, and a lot of kids respond to mapping, like uh, graphic organizers, uh, things that where you can hide something and reveal it, like you know, foldables, flip books, whatever. It really does get into their heads. Uh, it helps them remember things to study. It's like a study aid. So you really could use some of those things as well, just to kind of put it in there. But yeah, the confusion comes from when it's like, what, what did they just say? I don't even get that vocabulary word. What, what did they mean by that? Um, one time I, I took a, a, a funny Latin route and I said to them, 
and I'm going to teach you a Latin root word. And they're like, what's a Latin root word? You know, and I said, well, let's look at port. Port means to carry, right? Do you, do you think of any word that has port in it? They're like, oh, airport. I go, yeah. What do they carry? Oh, they carry people, right? Okay. So one after another, right? There were like transport. Um, and then one kid went, hey, there's a porta potty. There's a porta potty on, on my soccer field. I go, yeah. Did they carry the toilet to the field? They're like, oh my God. <laughs> and they were hysterical. But by using humor, and I said, well, what would that look like in a cartoon? You know, kids love graphic novels. They love cartoons. So going back to geometry, like, hey, what's Pentagon Pete doing with Trapezoid Ted? You know, I don't know. They can make up any story, their imagination, if you allow them to, versus, oh, that's silly. Sit down. Don't, you know, what are you doing? Be quiet. You know, when you allow that environment to be, uh, when their ideas, their creative thoughts come out, it really does change. It's a game changer. And I and I don't know, Joanne, if you're feeling this way. I mean, <clears throat> I uh, I use math as as your geometry comment. You know, sitting with a kid that is struggling with um, a concept, we're doing uh, fractions right now, and spending legitimately two minutes to take what you taught as a whole group lesson and revisit it as really focused instruction. And watching those light bulbs go off is just the most addicting thing about teaching. And I think through, you know, as we get transition out of hopefully um, COVID completely, I think we would all love that. I think there's an element of we can we can find that more appropriate to take those time and have small groups that, you know, watching a video that you recorded over and over again has a purpose for many of your kids, but not all of them that those are those features that you're talking about, that just the unlocking the potential. And, you know, we talk about behavior and discipline and the two major causes are frustration, that one's well known, and boredom, also well known. So when you kind of use that data as a resource and you take it as that leverage point and use it to, you know, I'm not going to create drilled down lessons that target, you know, this one shape in geometry is the one. No, I'm going to identify where are we directing a lot of our time. And then through that conversation, really try to target those specific instructions. So you, you talked about creativity being a huge passion of yours and that it's clearly, it clearly still is. So when you, when you came back into the classroom and you know you you talked about your your book and and bringing out the creativity in in your students. One of my favorite TED talks. I think it's I think it's by far the best TED talk I've ever seen with with Ken Robinson a, a long time ago. Talks about creativity and talks about how we educate creativity out of students. And it was always a big passion of mine. I think it's something I could have done better as a as a fifth grade teacher. You know, now seeing my own children. You know, my son is is going to be four soon. And the creativity in him is just, it's incredible to watch. Anytime we get something that we can build and tinker with, the things that he wants to imagine, he asks me to build a scuba diver out of these little blocks and I build it and he's making me become more creative in the way to imagine it because my first thought is I can't make a scuba diver out of these blocks. But then when I make something, I explain it to him, he loves it. And then, and seeing him grow with that. And so, you know, just talk to us about like, how did, how did that creativity grow yourself as you started to do it more in your classroom? Because we know that you didn't walk in, do creative stuff and write a book. It grew over time. And also clarify with us what grade levels and, and classes you were teaching at that time. Right. So I was in the elementary world, K to five. So any of those grades, I think the only grade I didn't teach was grade four, but you're it, missing it, out. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so what would happen was, you know, you have the curriculum and you would, you know, go through the lessons and they're like not that interested, right? They're not really perking up. They're not sitting up in their chair. They're slumping. But every time I integrated the arts, not just visual arts, right? Music, movement, theater, reader's theater, any, any kind of thing where their imagination needed to explode. I mean, there was, there was one... Um, unit that I taught on expository writing, you know, informational writing and kids are writing about famous 
places and people and all of this, right? But I had this one student, he was so stuck. He was like, um, I'm not writing. I don't, I don't want to be in the real world. His world was Harry Potter. Everything was Harry Potter. And um, at the time, I allowed my students, instead of writing their published piece to be on loose leaf paper or any kind of, you know, everybody has the same paper and the same stationery, and then it gets hung up on the bulletin board on a certain angle, right? Everybody looks the same. My class was like, hey, I'm reading about the Titanic. Is it okay? So they would make the ship, the portholes would open up, and paragraphs would be inside the portholes. And what would happen is they were learning from each other because I gave them permission. And Sir, you know, Sir Ken Robinson used to talk about that, about giving, it really is a permission for them to get their creative thoughts out and their ideas in a safe, non judgmental place. Because everything, everybody wants to put their judgment on something like, no, that's not the right way to do it. No, it's this way. This is how you figure it out. I mean, we even see that uh, in the mathematical classroom, right? Here, this is how you multiply. We're not going to do, you know, lattice multiplication or we're not going to, they cringe. They cringe if there's another way shown, but some kids might need that other way. So, yeah, so it, it became, uh, Ken, it became a mat. It became a way of slowly realizing and I jotted down all the times that my students came alive and it was during those moments not that I had to teach a lesson that was so creative all the time but you have to mix it up there was one year I put a bird feeder outside my classroom and it was nothing to do with the curriculum it was outside my classroom for me I wanted to look at something nice uh but slowly they were like hey what's that bird and you know I had to settle them down they're getting excited they're so I said, hey, if you're done with your work or if you um, are in between things and you're transitioning, right? So all the kids who, who were lazy and didn't want to get their work done were getting it done because they wanted to go to the window to look at the birds and record. But what I didn't realize was that they were talking about these birds at lunch. Their notebooks look completely different. So the mathematical learners were making charts and graphs and tally marks and the linguistic learners are writing stories and my musical learners are taking, you know, rocket Robin tweet, tweet, you know, they're rewriting lyrics to the song and they're just, their imagination was exploding, but they're talking to one another. So they're bringing together. It's like the pebble in the lake, that ripple effect. So it, it's incredible to watch, but when their curiosity was perking and their creativity was perking there, I am saying, wait a minute, how can I engage them more? So we connected to Cornell's Ornithology Lab and we tracked the migration of the birds on the East Coast because we we're in New Jersey. And so they were so happy to do that. They were like, wow, they really want to hear from us and what that was. So my field trip that year, I called Sam the Birdman. There's actually a guy called Sam the Birdman in our local, uh, yeah, he's a lo in the local Monmouth County Parks Department you know, department called him up. He's like, Hey, no, no, we don't, we don't uh, take kids out bird watching. That's for fifth grade. You guys are second, third grade. No. I said, come on, Sam, they really know their birds. He's like, listen, bring them in for a slideshow and a presentation. I I'll do a demonstration. And if maybe I'll see, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm like emailing the parents, get your binoculars ready. Cause I know this guy's going to change his mind. Lo and behold, up comes the slideshow. Why do these kids know the birds? Because that poster was outside of the window. They on their own created that. I didn't put them in a box and say, this is how you have to write it in your notebook. This is how you have to take in information. They did it on their own. They drove their instruction. And it was amazing to watch um, because I gave them permission. So we get we get to the place and he puts up the slide and they're like, you know, the goldfinch, that's the, our, you know, New Jersey bird, you know, chickadee <laughs> one after another, after another, he's like, Oh man, I think I, I made a mistake here, but we were ready for him. And he takes them outside and he brings them towards a fence. And he's like, guys, I want you to show you this really cool thing. So if you take a coffee can and you attach it to a fence, I'm going to show you. And he takes it out and there's this beautifully made nest and these gorgeous small little turquoise eggs. And what do you think the kids, they roar. They're like, Robin's eggs. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Why they even knew the shape and size of the eggs that the birds that they were looking at in the window at the bird feeder. So it was just 
uh, we just ate our lunch happily under the trees that day. And uh, there, I can't tell you the science and math scores that year were the highest they've ever been. And it really truly is a testament to that we have to let them lead sometimes and go outside the box. It wasn't in the curriculum to study birds. Uh, maybe we would study a state, you know, we would do state reports. So that kind of kind of made sense. Okay, there might be a state bird, right? Let's look that up. But their their thinking and their learning went beyond anything I could have imagined. And it was just wonderful to watch. But yeah. That was one of the best stories that we've ever had on this podcast. That was <laughs> that was just so cool. And and Matt, I I know I just cut you off, so I'll, I'll let you chime in. I just want to say that what I love about it is a lot of times, you know, when we talk about like getting kids interested in learning and sparking creativity and, and, you know, developing a culture for learning, it's like, find out what the kids are interested in, like tap into their interests. And that is good, but that's really hard to do all the time with all of your kids. Whereas you kind of just let this accident just fester in and grow and you capitalized on it. You didn't purposely create it, but you capitalized on it. And that's what made it a great teaching move is you capitalized on that and you let it spawn because you gave them permission. Like you said, you stepped out of their way. You didn't try to box them in. You, you know, you totally opened it up. And I was just going to add, you know, kind of on, on top of that, it's, it's one of those times where teachable moments turns into depth of learning. You know, teachable moments, we often think of, oh, there's a mess in the bathroom, let's revisit the rules. Or, you know, something happens in current events and we're trying to bring down the, the anxiety or, or something happens and you're like, okay, this is how you handle something we weren't planning for. And um, I know Ken and I have talked about different examples of, you know, uh, in brief summary, I had a, a three weeks left of school and I threw this idea out at the kids and they kind of liked it. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've got two and a half more weeks. I thought this was going to go so much longer. What other element can we add and add and add and add? And it's the probably the most proud thing that I've ever done with kids and things like, you know, parent teacher conferences where it's student led and you hear them recite, but it's not a regurgitation of what you said. It's, you know, in their own words, they understand it or kind of like, I'm sure there is probably the biggest pride in your life was uh, the bird man, you know, not even getting a word in that the kids are just feeding the information. It's just like, man, I knocked it out of the park, even though at the end of it, it doesn't necessarily feel like you did so much. It, I, you, I didn't do anything. Right? Yeah, you exactly. handed those those really keys over own. the kids. And yeah, it really was on their own, and um, it was just I I love you know finding out how things impact students, and so I just why not why not and and here it is right. So Sam he didn't mean anything by it again, putting, putting rules and boundaries on students. We tend to do that. We're like, we've got to stick to the curriculum. These are the standards. We can't, you know, we're not going to look outside the box, but by looking outside the box, it makes their learning even stronger and their knowledge base richer. And uh, so we really have to second guess sometimes when we put judgment on things. And Sam did that. He's like, no, I don't, that doesn't happen with second graders, just fifth graders. So in his mind, only fifth graders are able to do that. I, I'm sure these kids were functioning at a fifth grade level in that area without even knowing it. And if you told them, oh, we have to study fifth grade material, they're like, I can't study fifth grade material. I'm a third grader, right? They would just put that judgment on themselves like imposter syndrome, like, no, that's not me. I can't do that. Meanwhile, without knowing it organically, they figured it out, you know, so... Well, and it's also that, you know, text of self, text to self connection is usually the best version of learning. I mean, we love to justify text to text, right? Hey, here are two sources. How are the similarities? We love that Venn diagram. Um, but, you know, that text to self and whenever you can kind of um, pull personally, right now we're doing ecosystems. So, you know, how does uh, filling our aquarium with pond snails affect us? Well, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't I don't interact with them very often, but I come across these bodies of water. And if there's algae, you know, my dog's not going into that body of water. And and so, you know, making it almost personal 
And you can guarantee those kids took so much more from that sidetrack that you can easily touch into and, um, you know, also get kids on your side for the tough times of learning too. And that's, that's the really, you know, the best thing I know, Ken, you could probably speak way too long about that, but that was a guiding principle of, of your class is just how do I empower kids to get to a position that they are directing their own learning and, you know, it's your job to kind of thread the instruction and the, you know, almost the bumpers in bowling to keep it on track of, of learning focused. I, I think one of the, one that. of the pieces with that is, you know, like you said, Matt, when you, when you create an environment like you did, Joanne, you could say to your students, whether you did or not, but I know that you could listen, this next lesson, this next activity, 15 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, it's not going to be super exciting, but it's really important for us to learn these three vocabulary words or learn or read this story to build background knowledge because it's going to allow us to be successful for the next two weeks. And there were times where I said that to my kids and you know what? They just, they zoned in and they hunkered down and they paid attention in a way that, that we typically didn't because the classroom is typically buzzing and very dynamic. And you can call on them to do that because anyone it's hard for us to pay attention for a long time, but when someone says to you, hey, you really need to pay attention right now, we can, we can try our hardest and, and we can do it. And so, you know, you, you do have that element to lean into. So now as an administrator, Joanne, how are, you, how are you giving permission to your teachers to think outside the box, to, as, as you did as a creative educator? How are you giving them permission to feel safe to take those well, risks? Yeah, so I'm definitely finding that a lot of my teachers are, they really know me by now. I've been working with them over eight years and they're happy to come to me with ideas. Joanne, what do you think about this? What if, right, that's where curiosity starts. What if I were to implement this? Do you think it would work? Or So we've got great conversations going on because I they know that I'm not judging them in any way or going to get them in trouble if I see that they're off topic or if it helps, and they've kind of jumped in when I did lunch and learn programs, they were like, hey, do you need any help with that? And they were kind of learning along the way with me. So yeah, so we do have this great um, collaboration going on. And uh, I do give them permission. Um, I do what when we do work with uh, other teachers, um, sometimes when we integrate the arts, we usually work with the music teachers, the visual art teachers, for example, uh, going back to geometry, I know I keep going back there, just trying to keep it simple and not so confusing here on the podcast. But um, if you look at Kandinsky's uh, composition eight, right, it's just it's just full of full of um, ge you know geometric shapes and uh, concepts that help kids to learn that. So even just working together with teachers, not just with me, but with each other. And then um, we always have a book club every year where we dive into different, you know, modes of learning. And I, I know Teach Like a Pirate was a big uh, hit. And so that kind of led us into talking about conversations around how could we get the light back in our students who they, they've just gone dim, they don't want to learn, they're exhausted, they're frustrated. Um, what could we do to help them? Can I just uh, ask, and, and this might be from your teacher or administrative side, you know, I don't know if you would identify yourself as artistic, whether it's visually or musically or those type features. But, you know, one of the biggest things as teachers is we are fearful to step out of our comfort zone and, and really give up control and to consider things that we don't think that we would be good at. You know, I, I would feel comfortable getting up and doing a dance, but to ask me to sing, absolutely not type scenario. So how do you kind of guide students, or I guess teachers or students that don't feel like they have the same talent as maybe their peers, but to still create comfort in, you know, trying new things, you know, considering yeah, so other options? Yeah, so perfection is really the issue here, right? So we're looking at Pinterest, Google, social media, everything has to be perfect. 
right? So you're not going to sing because someone told you along the way you're not good at singing or someone told you along the way, what is that? You, what did you just draw? You know, and so, but what happens is we put those limiting beliefs on ourselves, right? No one else is, uh, to a child, they're not looking at your drawing on the board as all you have to say is, hey guys, I might not be Picasso, but I'm going to show you uh, the wing structure of a bat or whatever it is. And I'm going to try my best. So when they see you stepping out to do something that you're not comfortable doing or that you're not an expert in, that's going to give them the courage to step into something new, something that they might not be able to try. Where sometimes I've heard teachers say, I was in a kindergarten classroom. Don't, don't cringe. All right. You ready? I'm in a kindergarten classroom doing an observation and there were, and they're brainstorming on the letter B and she's got this chart and the kids are raising their hands and this one kid yells out bat and she's like great bat she's like like baseball he's like no the bat that hangs upside down she goes to turn around and write the word and draw a picture she's like I don't really know how to draw a bat could you think of another word Uh. (laughs) whoa it was like wait time out One, you just showed, you just modeled for that child fear or I'm not courageous enough. They, they hold you on the pedestal. So you just let them know that I'm not going to try something new and you've just given them a negative thought. Mm. I can't do it. You better help me. Now they're just trying to process the sound B. (laughs) They came up with that. Go with it. Yeah. Draw the bat. Say, listen, I know I can't draw a bat, but I'm going to do my best. Isn't that silly? Look at these wings. Here's the fact, you know, do whatever you have to do. But that modeling just sent them like, I don't want to do that. I'm too scared. I can't. Or even now that the, the child might even feel that they are. picked the wrong word. Mm. Yeah. You know, how are they going to know? Now they have to think about, I have to think of a word that my teacher can draw. Right. <laughs> Like, not a word that helps me to understand the sound and the phonemic awareness, but I have to think. I got to help them out. Oh, yeah. It's not even funny. I'm laughing, but it's not even, it was not even funny. I had a big talk. I was so upset. I said, I'm sorry, but we have to undo what you just did. We have to come up with another scenario where you show them and model for them that it is okay to take chances and risks and be okay with not drawing perfectly. That perfection's got to go. Uh, so if we're, if we're casting judgment early on, or we're letting kids know that we're judging them early on, they're not going to take any risks. They're going to be fearful. Listen, they're already fearful of what are my friends going to think of me? See, cause if I talk up in a meeting or if I talk up in the classroom or I ask a question, I might sound silly. I might sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. Now what? No, we've got to create that environment that they're free to release that, to say, I'm okay with that, or I'm not okay with that. Can you help me? What is it that I'm not getting? And they don't feel like everybody's going to laugh, oh, you know. So what are what are ways that we can purposely do that? Or what are other ideas that you have that we can purposely show fear, show taking risks? Because, you know, in that scenario, you know, now that teacher is probably was just totally unaware of what they did. Now you've made them aware as a good administrator. And now maybe the teacher can even purposely in the future, even if it's something she isn't, she feels she could draw, she could say, oh, that's going to be a real, really hard thing. I don't know if I can draw, like purposely feeding into that idea. What are other ways that we can, we can do that? I think the bottom line is this. If we're not enjoying the the role as a teacher. If we can't show the the students that we can be silly at times or we can make mistakes at times, it, 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 give me a scenario and I'll, I'll figure it out for you because honestly, it can be in any situation when Matt's saying, I don't want to sing. I'm not comfortable. Guess what? By singing you're you're they're saying, wow, he's giving it a try. I'm going to try that. Um, don't we sing in the shower? I mean, and we don't care. It's, it's silly, right? Why all of a sudden now we're in front of others we're not expected to be, um, you know, a famous person on the radio. That's not, and singing and, and, you know, getting a, a, a number one hit. That's not what it's about. 
uh, Michael Jordan didn't step onto the court and say, hey, I'm going to be an NBA player day one. It took a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of times where you forgive yourself and say, you know what, tomorrow's going to be a better day. Today, I, I didn't have a good day. It's okay. Tomorrow we get to have clean the slate, get to have a new day. Um, we're just getting so serious in the world. And the seriousness isn't going to help the kids, uh, you know, reach, you know, success and increase their knowledge. They're going to be more afraid than ever. They're not going to be who they were meant to be, their authentic self. Um, I just, you know, it's going to work against them and they're not going to feel good about themselves or they're pretending to be somebody they're not. That's even worse. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're seeing kind of the the unique kind of almost shy characteristics of a lot of kids. And so something like bringing out the creativity and boosting confidence and, you know, rewarding opportunity and, and out of the box thinking is honestly necessary, not just a good teaching ta tactic, right? It, it is something that is growing as just a, a need to support kids and the best thing for that to happen is to model it. So I think what you're saying is just something that needs to be echoed over and over again, because um, it's a, it's an area that, again, we're doing this from behind screens and, and behind microphones, but, you know, we obviously try to keep it as authentic as possible on this podcast and have real questions and real conversation, but it's still not the same thing as in person and, you know, reading facial expressions or how you're sitting in those type of situations that really contribute to that, that grand scheme. So, you know, you know, remember the show who wants to be a millionaire or oh, know, yeah. that whole thing and phone a friend. Okay. So picture like you, you just take something relevant in kids' lives. I mean, that was back then, but take something relevant that they're watching and implement it. So if they're they're not sure or if they've gotten the wrong answer, they're raising their hands and like, Yeah, that's not it. Do you want to phone a friend? Do you want like you want to come and sit in the hot seat? Right? Because why not? Why can't you do that? It's it's not like you're going to teach less information to them. You're going to make it fun. They're going to remember that. Uh, you know, you can have a panel and you, you, you have an expert sit up in the class. All right, we're going to refer to Ken. Uh, Ken, you're our mathematical expert. And Matt, you're our scientist in the classroom. Let's refer to them. We're going to call them up or they're going to sit in the hot seat. Whatever it is, it's fun. Um, when, when you think about teaching a vocabulary word, one time I handed out aluminum foil, didn't cost a lot of money, right? I'm like, here's the thing. I want you to, um, show me the word freedom in this aluminum foil. And they're like, what do you mean? And they couldn't, they, they just couldn't imagine it. And I said, all right, here's one piece of aluminum foil. Could I peel it off in straight lines? Can I curve it? Can I twist it? And all of a sudden they started to understand that they could break apart. They can move it, bend it, you know, make it stand. So it, and then you've got the stem coming in, right? You've got all of the, those challenges happening and then they can reveal it. Now you do a gal, you don't even make them uh, talk. You know, they, they sit there and then when they're done, you put it on a table and have them walk around the table because every single person's structure is going to be different. You say, okay, what are you thinking about? What could you tell me? We don't know whose is who. So what could you say? Give me one thing that you notice, one thing it reminds you of. And so they start to think about other people's work. And wow, I wonder if that is, I have a wondering question. Does that mean, is that the flag? Is that a wounded warrior? What What is that? And and then their thinking expands. Do you see what I'm saying? So it becomes, they don't have to memorize. Freedom is, you know. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally get that. We're going to write down the definition. We're going <laughs> to write it over, put it on an index card, and just memorize it. Some kids don't memorize that way. They actually learn from each other better than us standing up there and just spilling things out. So I love group work. I love kids that come together to create newspaper articles, to create um, P 
pieces of writing. Um, yeah, for sure. So what advice would you give to a teacher that, you know, they, they want to start to be more creative. They, they see the holes in, in what they're doing and they see that they're not, they're not doing this enough, but they're very intimidated to get started. They, they don't, you know, to, to kind of quote the book you mentioned earlier, it's teach like a pirate. He talks in there about people that think they're not creative when everybody is creative. They're just not asking the right questions. So what is your advice to just help them have one successful lesson or one successful moment to build that momentum and, and, and keep that momentum moving forward? Okay. So when we think about the different learners out there, most kids are visual learners, right? They, they understand icons. They could tell without even knowing that's Google, they can, they know it's Google, right? They just see, you know, everything is so visual. And so I would start with the visual first. And I mean, we have search engines, right? So again, if you're in geometry, let's go back to geometry, uh, famous works of art that have geometric shapes is a search engine. Like, I, I'm not expecting my teachers to think of this on their own and be this pool of resource. Uh, sometimes we brainstorm. Guys, have you looked on Google to, to let's just take visual arts, for example. Um, and they could start there if they can implement one thing uh, that connects to the curriculum somehow. And it's out there. People are like, no way does famous works of art connect to geometry or yeah it's out there it, um and you know visual art is is a good way to to begin um i love you know when ki when kids um experiment with things also we talked about the kinesthetic learners right the for them to get their hands on something like the modeling clay the the, the play-doh a uh, perpendicular what does perpendicular look like you know, can you stand in next to a parallel line in this classroom? Is that the doorway? Is that the window frame? Are you perpendicular to it? Or are you, you know, um, you know, movement, you know, make a diagonal line. You know, can you walk to uh, one time? I, the gym teacher was out. We had it. We had to teach gym. So I'm like, all right, I have to I have to teach uh, prepositional phrases <laughs> when we go back. That was in the curriculum. Right. So I'm like, well, we're in gym. So I'm like, all right, guys, spread out. All right. And I, and I, I said, okay. And I, I quickly wrote them on, I don't know, there's some paper in the gym. So I quickly wrote, you know, uh, in, you know, in front of between along, alongside, like whatever it was behind in front of all of this stuff, they had to model it. They had to, you know, model it for with their, and they had such a good time. There was no question when we went back to the classroom that they, some kids I allowed to draw a picture and write about it. You know, the fence is next to the tree. <laughs> the tree is above the ground. You know, um, the worms live below, below, and they would underline the preposition. It was just crazy. Um, and at the same time, they were remembering what they did with their friends in the gym class. And it wasn't like, all right. Here's a word box of prepositions. Fill it in the line when you read the sentence. That's okay too. With, I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach that way. I'm saying mix it up. And, and just to start with something very simple, it doesn't have to be this extravagant lesson, this extravagant idea. It could be just as simple as, um, like I said, aluminum foil, Play-Doh, Googling, you know, a famous work of art. I think that's where, you know, I think sometimes when we try to plan creative lessons, we feel like it needs to be like well thought out of grandiose, right? like you right. probably <laughs> didn't have a great amount of time to say like, oh, I'm going to be covering phys ed. And what I was sitting right. down to look at was how I was going to teach prepositional phrases. Okay, well, how are <laughs> exactly. we going to merge those together? And, mm -hmm. and that's where, you know, some of that great thinking and, and maybe the signs of you working in the business world where it was like maybe a little bit higher pressure made, made right. a big difference. I want to yeah. just kind of add um, something or, or kind of uh, another question to this. Um, but, you know, I, I just finished up a, a PD day recently where we have a brand new curriculum in both our math and ELA um, curricular areas. 
And we spent a portion of the time mapping out where we would expect to be by the end of the school year. And um, initially, I was thrilled to be like, oh, I'm going to be further than I expected to be. Um, And then three, four or five days into that calendar, and I wasn't keeping up with the time frame that I was expecting, you know, guilt starts setting in, pressure starts setting in, um, frustration, what have you. Me being frustrated at kids, hey, you're not doing this nearly fast enough for me. What would you say and what is your conversation instead of towards kids? What is your conversation towards, you know, your admin, even if you are a teacher in this position to say, like, I want to take time to dive deeper into instruction because I think generalization is a really important thing. Like what you're saying here is, you know, acting out these shapes allows me to generalize that word instead of just knowing the dictionary definition. And how do you have that conversation, especially as a new teacher, to say, I, th- I know that tapping into kinesthetic learning or visual learning or auditory learning um, in a variety of different ways is going to touch more of my kids deeper, but my scope and sequence tells me I need to be at this point by this point. So, you know. That it, happens a lot, Matt. Yeah. That happens a lot. So working with curriculum for the past eight years, uh, especially when you have a new program that happens all the time and you don't get the pacing down until teachers work with it two to three years, or maybe I should say three to five, when you start to see results of teachers getting comfortable with the new curriculum in order to teach it the way they need to. But here's the thing, right? You've got the overarching essential questions. You have the standards, you know what you have to teach, right? So if that section or that lesson has four to five worksheet pages and that's what is considered the pacing, you still could teach whatever's in those four to five pages in another way. Just because the textbook company says, well, this is the way we want you to, it's not like you're going to teach something different. You're still going to reach the standards. It doesn't mean, well, if you filled out the five pages, you're more apt to learn the standard than you are if you don't if you do something different? No, it's that at the end of the day, did you reach your objective? Did, did you reach what you intended those kids to learn? Did that exit slip come back and say, yup, they learned it. They know what it is because then I could prove it. So I, I never have this, the teachers get caught up in the amount of pages that they have to cover. What is it that the kids have to learn at the end of that week, if there's three to five goals that week that they have to learn, it's okay. We, we could skip a page or two, right? Because if it's repetitive, send a page home for homework, rip it out and send it home for homework. Um, as long as the concepts are solidified, that's, that's the main point. And how do we know they're solidified? We've got to use that assessment. At some point, you've got to know where the kids are at in order to say, hey, I've got to push forward or I've got to review, I've got to pull them in small group and I've got to revisit this information because they don't know it. Yeah, can I just, um, can I just that, add? That throws, a, that throws a wrench into into pacing. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I just add, just, you know, as teachers, we we get the, the pressure of doing it with fidelity or or, you know, doing it the way it's intended. And so, Sometimes we don't necessarily feel like we have the right to deviate from that. And it's hard to go to our, you know, assessment anchors and be like, oh, check mark, check mark, check mark. I know I got those things. And like you said, you know, even the best assessment is difficult to say, hey, I know they learned it completely, you know, so that when you see a question that's related to it, you feel comfortable that they'll be successful. And I think, you know, like everything, it's generalization. Can they, take what they've learned and apply it to the question in front of them. But, you know, I know you mentioned this with Ken Robinson, you know, giving yourself the the opportunity or the right or the, I can't remember the exact words, but, you know, how do you balance that fidelity? Because I have a this brand new curriculum that tells me I should be doing one one lesson a day. Yeah. And they love, you know, listen, every, every curriculum out there states, well, we're research-based. And we are research-based. 
So you have to follow step A, B, C, D. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Um, I'm following A, B, C, and D. And my kids aren't still getting it. They're still not getting it. So what do we go back and tell the, the company? Well, I followed it with fidelity. My kids still don't learn it. Now I have the autonomy as a teacher to step out and say, my kids aren't getting it. I've got to try another way. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be with you in a minute. And you have to change lanes because right now we're staying in our lane. But you got to change lanes and say, I've got to try something new. If I try something new, let's see if they can make it stick. And then we'll go back to that. Um, the problem is, is to monitor when they get off to lane and they stay there and then they don't ever go back. Uh, but that is a challenge amongst administrators. But I do allow them to go off a little bit because if you're telling me that the students are still not getting it and I'm following a scripted teacher guide, now what? It's standardized yeah, and yeah, you can't avoid I it. was... Um very anti-program as a classroom teacher because I felt as though with the experience I had teaching fifth grade for multiple years and I, I was just confident in myself as a teacher but at the same time now being being on a slightly different side as an instructional coach working with administrators more we've had new programs roll out that I think have been extremely beneficial to our elementary schools you know one of the biggest pieces they say is that the push for fidelity is not permanent, but it's that if teachers don't approach the program with fidelity, they don't understand the research and the theory and the structure behind it. And then they don't get everything out of the program because they didn't do it exactly the way they should. But then there's that balance of once you learn the program where you make those pivots and you you change lanes, like like you said. But the other piece that I see too is when teachers have been exposed to multiple programs over multiple years, they forget how to change lanes. They forget how to be creative because they just want the scripted program. And so it's a it's a tough thing to balance. And I think it's really important to continually uh, coach and, and develop our professionals to make those professional decisions to pivot and, and to change lanes. It's a it's a tough topic for for, for sure from from both perspectives. Um, so. To be respectful for time, I do want to jump into our exit ticket, the same four questions we ask every guest every week. I know we also have the lesson lines that we do once in a while, but I know we got into the bird feeder story, which I, I loved. So um, so question number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Uh, there are so many, but the first thing is is to let them know that you, they, they're seen, heard, and understood. If, if they feel like they've been ghosted and you, you don't even know anything about them, they're not going to work hard for you. So I think building those um, relationships with your students and making them understand that you're their biggest cheerleader, you're going to do anything you can to help them learn, uh, give them any kind of manipulative or uh, study aid that you can think of just to, to help them out. And even if they need someone to listen to, I know sometimes uh, kids want to just say, hey, you're going to be in the lunchroom. Can I just talk to you for a minute? And so you have to give up your lunch a little bit. I, I know it's hard, but they're just, you know, they're little kids. So that would be my first answer to the question. <laughs> I love that. Um, jumping into, you know, the best piece of advice that you've received, and it could be from a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student. Well, the best piece of advice was don't take life so serious because uh, things change, life changes, situations change. Uh, and so we can't keep ourselves in a, well, this is, we've always done it this way. I have to keep doing it that way. Uh, be flexible enough to, um, to laugh at yourself, to, to, you know, even think about things in a new and different way, be open-minded. So yeah, that was the best advice. Perfect. Um, another thing is, you know, there are heavy, challenging times, you know, the school year goes in waves, there are days or even weeks we struggle to, to get through and survive. So what's something you could say to someone listening right now that's in one of those down times to help them power up through that moment of struggle? 
you've got to go back to what brings them joy, honestly. Uh, work is work, but that's not our life. You know, there was a book written, I forgot it was like Slash. You know, we're, not, we're a teacher, but we're also other things. And we have to give value and space and respect to our, the other parts of ourselves. And so take care of yourself um, and just nurture yourself and, and do something separate from teaching, you know, dive into something different and, uh, and think about what brings you joy. Even if it's like jumping in a puddle, I don't, you know, I don't know, uh, but you know, do something fun. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm excited about this question for you. It's, it's very easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom out of everything that we've talked about tonight, if you have to boil it down, what separates teachers who constantly seek change, innovation, and bringing in new teach, teaching strategies into their classrooms? Uh, I think there's a passion that you really can't create. It, like, it has to be inside of you, that fire and passion inside of you, that you want to make a difference. And you have to be open-minded. You have to be ready to try new things. You have to be able to forgive yourself and not feel bad. Like, Oh man, this, I was horrible today. I, I can't believe this went, nobody understood what I taught today. Um, it, it might not be all be you, uh, but it, it takes a resilience. It takes a lot of strength and passion and love, love of learning. If you're a lifelong learner, you're, you're going to be an excellent teacher. That's all I could say. Beautiful. I personally, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of Ken. I've enjoyed this conversation quite a bit. Um, Joanne, if, if our audience would like to connect with you and continue that conversation, what's the best way to follow along? Well, they can find me on Facebook or Instagram. It's Joanne, J-O-A-N-N -N, underscore Nocera, N-O-C-E-R-A. Uh, that is the also the name of my uh, website I have, joannenocera.com. And I would love to help out. I, I'm starting an Ignite the Spark program, and that's uh, teaching. Um, I, I'm working with some college students now, and I'm giving a talk at the Grunin Arts Center on staying curious and so how to integrate the arts. But uh, we're going to ignite the spark in our students. We're going to get that light back, love of learning, because uh, they've been through a lot of difficult times and us as adults and teachers and parents, we've been through a really rigorous, uh, unprecedented times, really, honestly. So uh, it's time now to get the spark back, the love of learning. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm here to help in any way. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I just want to reiterate, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and you had fantastic stories, practical ways to, uh, increase the creativity into our classrooms and, and open the doors and open the box for the, the students to, to have that permission to do so. So thank you so much. Your kids were obviously incredibly lucky to have you as a teacher. And now your teachers are very lucky to have you as a leader, giving them permission to, to teach in that way that's best for their kids. So they're, they're super lucky to be able to work for you and work with you. So everything that Joanne just mentioned, her, her links, um, Joanne, if you could send me your book, as well, where it can be purchased. I'll, I'll link everything up on our show notes page, which can be found at powereduup.com slash show 65. And we'll have everything linked up there as well. Um, and just thanks again, Joanne. I, I look forward to following along and, and, and staying in touch with you. It's been a, a great conversation. So uh, Matt, why don't you close up shop for us here tonight? All right, Joanne, as we power down this episode, you left us feeling powered up. Thank you for the time. Everyone stay well, stay happy and healthy. Take time for yourself and the school year, believe it or not, will be uh, coming to a close sooner than we, we can even handle it. So um, with that being said, we'll talk to you all next week. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Matt. <laughs>